Okay, we're going to do the afternoon in April morning by Howard Fast, and it begins on page 159. So let's take a look at the reading questions before we actually get into the reading. We know that the previous chapter was the midday, and in the midday, Adam sees quite a bit of action. And so let's see what happens in the afternoon. Where do, where do we go from there? So the questions are, one, how did Granny's perspective toward Adam change um, and why? So why did her perspective toward Adam change? And that perspective would be how did Aunt Granny's opinion of, of Adam change? Question number two was, what is, was the British behavior in Lexington governed by a sense of ethics? In other words, was, it go, was their behavior guided by any proper behavior or, mor or morals? And then number three, what details influence Adam's reaction to his father's death and why? Okay, so each of those will be written as a paragraph. You have to have direct evidence. You have to have a topic sentence, direct evidence, and you have to have your commentary on how that direct evidence supports your topic sentence. All right, beginning on page 159. We were about a mile and a half to the south of Lexington now, between the Watertown Road and the Monotony Road. And all that was home to me, all that was warm and sweet and good, my mother and my brother Levi and Granny and Ruth, my relatives and my friends, all of this was a hoot and a holler away, just over the hill and across the trees, just so near that I could almost reach out and touch it. But instead of going home, as any sane person would, I was part of a motley group of farmers who were off to trap a British army and destroy it. It made no sense whatsoever, and I said so to Cousin Simmons. Well, Adam, he said, scratching his head, it's war now, you know, and in wartime, things don't make sense the way they would in peacetime. I had a belly full of war and killing, Cousin Simmons. I know that, Adam. So have I. When you come right down to it, maybe so has everybody here, except old fire eater like Solomon Chandler. But we can't stop. Why not? Good heavens, Adam. We declared ourselves. There, there just is no stronger declaration of a man's purpose than to take a gun and shoot someone dead. But they shot us first. That's an argument, Adam. And we're past arguments. Gun shooting is a declaration, not an argument. Nobody's going, nobody's going to be calm and reasonable about who shot first. There's been too much shooting already to ever trace our way back. Now we're enemies until one side or another wins its purpose. If we were to back off now, they'd come with their gallows rope and hang up maybe a hundred, maybe a thousand, maybe ten thousand. We'd never sleep a peaceful night again. Not ever again, no sir. Then when will it end? When will it end, Adam? I tell you when it will end. When we drive them back into their ships and when their ships sail away from here and leave us in peace in our own land. Not until then. You're talking about a time, maybe years of time, I said wearily. Maybe years of time, Adam. That's true. I'm talking about today, Cousin Simmons. I'm talking about right now, about going home right now. Heavens to Holland, lad. Where would you go? The, no, the red co coats are no doubt entering Lexington right this precious minute. They wouldn't catch me. Ah, so maybe this really is in Lexington. There's two arguments about that. All right, going back to the story. They wouldn't catch me. There's a real smart observation. Suppose you tell me how you are going to manage that. I'd crawl up, I muttered. I'd lay there at the edge of the town until they left. Why, the place, the place is crawling with them, and you'd go crawling in there? That makes no sense at all, Adam, and you know it. Maybe I do know it, Cousin Simmons. I'm just sick of this whole bloody business. I can understand that, Cousin Simmons nodded. You're just a boy, and you've had a hard enough time of it, and a long day to boot, a terrible long day. Don't you think I'd like to see you out of this, you being my own kin and fatherless? But that's just it. What is? The fact that you're Moses Cooper's firstborn, and there isn't a man here who doesn't know it, and doesn't know how he was killed in the slaughter. In other words, Adam, you don't have a choice. If you run away now, they're going to think you're a coward who doesn't want to avenge your father's death. Okay, moving on. We paused for a few minutes to rest ourselves on the little bare hillock we called the Indian burying ground. Although as far as I know, knew, no one was buried there. My father once told me that the Indians, being heathen, did not properly bury their dead, but built a sort of frame structure on it, open and uncovered to the sky and the sun and the rain and the snow. 
I had the I had liked the notion and half regretted that I was not born an Indian, for it seemed infinitely preferable to being lowered into a deep wet hole in the ground. Now the thought came back to me, a stabbing awakening of grief and remorse. The guilt attached to the way I had allowed myself to be flung into the battle and absorbed by it, with my father laying in our home, hardly even cold with death. I felt that the least I could do for him was to keep my thoughts on him and keep my sorrow alive. I felt even worse when someone shouted that Lexington was burning. There were well over 150 men in our little army by now, and we all stood dumbfounded and helpless on the little hillock, staring northward where smoke rose into the sky. We discovered subsequently that only three houses had been set afire and actually burned down, the Loring House, the Mulligan House, and the Bond House. But from the amount of smoke in the sky, it appeared to us then that the entire village was being consumed. I was sick at heart with the thought that our house was burning and that there was nothing at all that I could do about it. I was asking myself, what about Mother and Granny and Levi? Were they in the house? For all I knew, they could be hiding down the cellar, trapped there, with the house burning down over their heads. I said as much to Cousin Simmons, whose own face was desolate enough, sad enough, depressed enough. Oh no, Adam, he replied sadly, sadly. That's one thing you don't have to worry about. Your grandmother would not hide herself in the cellar if all the dragoons in England were in her front yard. It's Ruthie and Goody Simmons I'm distressed about. It's a bitter thing for a man to have to stand idle and helpless and watch his home being consumed into ashes. Some of the men began to talk of going up and attacking the British and driving them out of the town. It was wild, desperate talk. We had inflicted awful damage upon the redcoats and we'd do more before the day was over. But by not going up against the volleys of their muskets when they could all stand in their lines together and see what they were shooting at. So the talk was only talk, no more than that. Jonathan Crisp, who had been on the common with us, was there with his cousin Salem, who was a year younger than he, and they both burst into tears. The men watched them and shook their heads sadly, because the whole world appeared to be crumbling around us, and none of us had been prepared for it or had anticipated it. It happened too quickly. I could see that the men were driving themselves sick with their frustration. Such a crowd of us standing here on the hillock and not being able to do one blessed thing to rescue the town from the redcoats. Then Solomon Chandler sang out so that everyone would hear him. One thing, lads, the British are there now, but not for long. The last of them will be out before the hour's up. Why? Because it makes sense. Either they're back in Boston by darkness or they'll never be back there again. The men let out a cheer to that. Everyone wanted to find a reason to extract, extract a crumb of comfort. And just then, three committee men on horseback came riding up. They had a force of 100 men from Watertown and Cambridge, and they were just waiting down along the Monotony Road, just about a mile from where we were. They told us that a relief army of redcoats from Boston, 1,500 of them, had gone by about an hour ago into Lexington, and that before another hour was up, they'd probably all be marching down the road and back to Boston. They were out to find everyone they could so that the redcoats would retain a good and substantial memory of the Monotony Road. And you found us you did, Solomon Chandler grinned. That broke the tension. Everyone began to talk and shout and swear and wave their guns. It was a wild mood that took hold of the men, as if they realized, as Cousin Simmons had put it, that there was no more undoing of what had been done. Solomon Chandler climbed onto his horse and shouted, Follow me, laddies! And then we all streamed after him, down off the hillock and toward Monotony Road. I didn't want to go, yet I went. We all went. We were in the grip of a force outside of ourselves. I knew that my heart was breaking with anxiety over the burning of the village, and I tried to give myself strength and purpose by telling myself that everything I had ever loved was destroyed or dead, and I might as well be dead too. So it doesn't matter if he goes to war. There was a place our people had in mind where the Monotony Road dips between two banks of earth, with a great tangle of wild blackberry bushes on one side and a windfall of dead trees on the other. I knew the place well, because the bramble patch made for the best rabbit hunting in the whole neighborhood, and many was the time Father and I hocked down there for an early morning shooting. Now the plan was to drag enough fallen trees across the road to block it, and then back the trees up with rocks and dirt. With such a breastwork, we felt we could hold the British long enough for a considerable army of Essex men, who were said to be marching in under the leadership of Colonel Pickering, to reach us. I suppose that there was some vague possibility that the plan might have worked. In any case, it was the only plan of any sort that emerged from that incredible and catches can day of battle. Everything else that had happened was the result of some sudden notion of this or that committee men, and the only reason that 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 the battle went on an hour after hour was that no one was in any position to halt it or direct it. 
It was perfectly true that, there, that before the reinforcements reached the first Redcoat army, they wanted to surrender. They were just about going out of their minds, plagued by an enemy they couldn't see, unable to use any tactics of battle they had learned or practiced in Europe. Shooting away all of their ammunition at stone walls, woods, and thickets, and losing almost a quarter of their number in dead and wounded. But there was no one they could surrender to, no one they could talk to or parley with. And when one of them came to the roadside west of Lexington with a white flag, he was shot dead by Abraham Clyde of Concord, who thought the white flag was only another one of the various regimental flags the Redcoats carried. The white flag is the white flag of surrender. Ugh. So our plan might have worked and everything that followed might have been different if the British hadn't already started down the Monotony Road before we reached it. We were still a quarter of a mile away when we heard the Watertown and Cambridge men banging away at them. Cousin Simmons and I and four or five of the others crawled into the windfall and wriggled our way through the tangle of trees until we got a view of a, hundred, a, view of a few yards of the road. We were as well hidden there as a fox in her earth, about 60 or 70 paces from the road, and we began to shoot at the redcoats passing by. It was, a, it, was strange, it was a strange and dreamlike business, lying there and seeing bits of red color emerge from the powder smoke that hung all over the place and over the road as well, then watching everything disappear under the smoke and only the smoke to shoot into, and then a bit of red here or a bit of red there, and such a feeling of world gone mad, for there was nothing the redcoats could do but march on and accept their measure of death, and the bulk of our committee men running down the road from place to place, so that they were always with the army, like flies on a dying beast. But we, our little group of people, remained in our cover, for there was no way that the redcoats could reach us, and most of us were too tired now to go running back and forth along the road. We lay there and fired at the redcoats and the smoke, or at least Cousin Simmons and the others did. I fired off my fowling piece once, and then I realized that at this range, even if some of the birdshot did reach the redcoats, it would sting no harder than a mosquito. It was a great relief to find some sensible reason not to go on shooting. I burrowed into the ground behind a fallen tree, rested my cheek against the stock of my gun, listened to the shooting and screaming and cursing, more profanity, profanity in five minutes than one heard in our village in the course of a year, and then fell asleep. It might strike you as strange that I would fall asleep right in the, middle, the midst of a battle, and you might even consider it downright ungracious that anyone should go to sleep during a battle as talked about and lied about and written about as this one. But the fact of the matter was that I had gone without a night's sleep and been through the massacre on the common and had quartered back and forth across the country since then like a fox driven to distraction, so that the wonder of it was, not that I had finally fallen asleep, that I, but that I had managed to remain awake as long as this. I was awakened by the silence. I guess it was the first silence in six or seven hours, and it was just unbelievable and a little frightening as well. I didn't mean, don't mean that it was a complete and total silence or anything unnatural or spooky. There were sounds in the distance and in the background, as there always are, but even these sounds were muffled by the tangled pile of trees and missing were the violent and awful sounds of the battle. The crash of firearms and the savage shouting and swearing of men in anger and pain. When I listened more carefully, I thought I could still hear battle sounds, but far off and very faint. It was still daylight outside, but under the windfall was a sort of comforting twilight, and being used to gauging time without a pocket watch, I had a feeling that at least an hour had passed. I lay still for a while, little while after I had wakened, luxuriating in the peace, and then I heard the noise of twigs and branches breaking, men making their way into the windfall, and voices, first the voice of the reverend. God be kind to us, Joseph, and merciful. I tell you frankly that I don't have the courage to go back to Gouda Cooper and tell her that her son as well as her husband lies dead today. What about myself? Cousin Simmons answered. Aside from having the boy's blood on my own conscience, I'll have to face her. Why didn't you send him home? She'll ask me. The boy's blood isn't on your conscience, Joseph. No man's blood is on anyone's conscience today, unless it be on the conscience of the Englishman who made the first slaughter on the common. You don't know Goody Cooper, Reverend. Where did you see him last? Where did you leave him? Trouble is, Reverend, I don't think I ever knew a better or more uncomplaining boy. He was a good boy, Joseph, no question about that. It just shakes my faith in the Almighty to think that an innocent cut down like this. Nothing should shake your faith, Joseph. His ways are inscrutable. They're unknowable and un, um, you can't um, criticize them. Uncomplaining, Reverend, 
when you considered all that boy went through since last night? At first it was pleasant and rewarding to lie there and listen to them talk about me in the past tense. I guess there was never a boy who didn't imagine himself dead so that he could take comfort out, uh, out of the fine things said about him. But there was a note in their voices that made me wonder whether they had the same respect for my intelligence as for my forbearance. I sat up and called out to them. God be praised, the reverend cried, helping me to my feet. Cousin Simmons asked if I was wounded. No, sir, I'm all right. Then what on earth happened to you, Adam? I fell asleep. The both of, me, the both of them stared at me open mouth. You what? I fell asleep, I repeated. I just fell asleep. Uh, so long as you're all right, the reverend said. They helped me out of the windfall, and I asked Cousin Simmons about the battle. It's down past Cambridge by now, and the committee men are marching in from all over. If the Redcoats get back to Boston, they're there to stay. There'll be 5,000 of our men around Boston before nightfall. Then can we go home, I asked him. We're all going home, Adam. There's others had more sleep and more rest. But what, what would I be coming home to? I didn't know. And for all I knew, the town could be in ashes and everyone dear to me dead. When I saw the tower of the meeting house, I felt better, and then I saw the Parker Barnes on the outskirts of town, and I told myself if they had burned one, they would have burned the other two. You might think we would run in our haste to be there and see what had happened, but you don't hurry for bad news. Also, we were tired, all three of us, so we came up to the town slowly, and bit by bit we realized that it still stood. Only the three houses that I spoke of before burned down. I left Cousin Simmons and the Reverend to go to my own house. We were not the only ones returning to the village. Others came across the fields, and still others were trudging wearily up the monotony road, and all of them could be defined by a sort of tired sadness that was evident in the way they walked and the way they trailed their guns. We had won the battle, but there is less joy in winning a battle than the history books tell you. Best to go home, Adam, the Reverend said. I will come by and pay my respects later. I would have begged them to come along with me and not leave me with the task of facing what I would have waited me alone. But when I looked at them, I had no heart to. Both of them had aged woefully. Their faces were gray and drawn and covered with a stubble of beard, with dirt and grime and dried blood. Their clothes were torn and filthy, and their eyes were red with fatigue and gunpowder irritation. I felt that I must present as dreadful uh, an appearance, but I was younger than they were, and nothing can feel as superior as youth. So I nodded and left them and walked toward the house approaching it from the back where the herb garden was levi must have been watching and waiting for me my own sight was blurred for the sun was already low and burning into my eyes and i heard him before i saw him shouting adam 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 he hurtled toward me and plunged into my arms and i just let my gun drop and hugged him as if he was everything in the world he was crying and i began to cry too i sat down on the ground still holding him tight and did my best to stop my tears i knew that it would only be moments before i had to face mother and i didn't want it to be with tears in my eyes i could imagine that there were enough tears for that day we thought you were dead levi sigh, sobbed there was a big damn fool from concord come by here and he said he saw you lying dead up at the crossroads do I look dead? Oh, Adam, I don't want you dead. Well, I'm not dead. I'm alive. I may be tired to death, but I'm alive. I don't want you dead, Adam. Stop saying that I'm dead because I'm not dead. I shook him and he looked up at me and managed to smile through his tears. Then I got to my feet and there at the edge of the herb garden, mother was standing with Aunt Granny next to her. Granny's arms around her to hold her up and mother's face as white as snow. Her mouth was open a little, the lips trembling. Granny just stared at me, shaking her head slightly. He's not dead, Levi said apologetically. Mother took a few steps toward me. I'm awful dirty, I whispered. I guess I've never been so dirty in my whole life. Then Mother came up to me and took me in her arms, holding me so tight I thought my ribs would break, her face buried in my dirty shirt. Then she let go of me and stepped back and began to cry. Granny went over to her, stroking her shoulder and whispering, poor dear, poor dear. It seemed that to me that Granny might have spared a moment for greeting me, but she hardly appeared to know that I was there. Levi picked up my gun, and Granny led Mother back into the house, myself following them. A number of neighbors were in the kitchen or standing outside. Ruth was there, and her mother and her widow, Aunt Susan, and old Mrs. Cartwright, the midwife, who always helps out on funeral, on funeral occasions when it comes to the laying out and the shrouding. And there were some of Levi's friends, the Albright boys, and little Jonah Parker, who had death in his own family. They made way for me to enter the kitchen. Ruth held back, but never took her eyes off of me. And the widow Susan took my arm. 
Mother dropped into a chair and stared at me, her whole body shivering and the tears running down her cheeks, and Granny's face was all twisted up with her own attempt to refrain from weeping, realizing, perhaps, that it would only, make a, it would only take a little more to have all of those women half hysterical. Hold on a sec. i got to check my phone. Okay, continuing. I had, ha I had anticipated a bad time of coming home, but I hadn't thought it would be anywhere as heartbreaking and uncomfortable as this. For the life of me, I don't know, didn't know what to say except to tell Goody Simmons that Cousin Simmons was back and at their house. You go there, Ruthie, she told her daughter, and tell him we're here. Shall I take him upstairs, Miss Cartwright asked Mother. Mother didn't respond, but the widow Susan nodded, and Mrs. Cartwright took my hand and led me upstairs and into the main bedroom, where Father's body was laid out on the bed. At first I was frightened to death and would have given ten years of my life not to have to go into that room. I held back at the doorway. Mrs. Cartwright cooed at me. Come, come now. Nothing to be afraid of. It's birth, marriage, and death. Always has been that way and always will. Someday your own children will look at you all stretched out and washed and combed. And how do you suppose they're going to feel? Now come right in here, Adam. It was poor consolation, but at least it turned my mind from my fear and reluctance to an old, established, and ever-increasing dislike of Mrs. Cartwright. I was able to assure myself that she was unquestionably the most repulsive and insensitive old lady in the Middlesex County, and that was some small comfort. I walked into the room and looked down at Father. Pay your respects, she cackled. Oh, get out of here and leave me alone, Mrs. Cartwright, I snapped at her. What will I do to Claire, she began. And I interrupted her and told her that in no uncertain terms to get out. Then she left muttering and coughing with indignation. I was left alone then with my father, who was not my father but a body, with all that was meaningful and important gone out of it. It was the ending of a day when I had seen many bodies, bodies of red coats and bodies of committee men. All my life long, death had, death had only touched me lightly, but I had lived all day with death today. I was too numb to be moved anymore. I didn't even want to weep. Later and many times afterward, word, I would remember my father, but not the corpse on the bed. I left the room then, closing the door gently behind me. When I returned to the kitchen, Mother had composed herself and Granny came over to me, took my hand and squeezed it. All the other women had gone. I guess the Simmons women went to greet Cousin Joseph, even though he hadn't been killed. He deserved at least an acknowledgement of his return. Mrs. Cartwright must have stalked out in anger. Levi stood in a corner. He couldn't take his eyes off of me. You must be hungry, Mother said. I am, but I'm dirtier than I'm hungry. I just don't believe I'm home without you remarking on it, Mother. I guess it could suffer to be remarked on, Mother nodded, looking at me now the way she would normally regard her son, and not the way you looked at someone returned from the dead. I have seen you dirty before, Adam Cooper, but not this dirty. That's your new coat, isn't it? It is. That's right, Mother. How did you tear your shirt that way? Granny asked me, crawling on my belly through a windfall. Indians have bellies, Granny said, fighting her own battle with her own torment and fighting it gallantly. But in our, in our family, people have they had stomachs for as many generations as we care to contemplate. Yes, ma'am, I nodded. I would have said it's stomach. It was the excitement. What excitement? As far as I know, the excitement is over. Where is that red coat army? back in Boston, the way I hear it. There was a momentary passing glitter in Granny's old eyes. Then civilization reasserted itself. Back in Boston, you say? We drove them. We drove them out every foot of the way and all the way back to Boston. How many did you kill, Adam? Levi cried. As for you, Mother said to Levi, there's more important things than shouting gibberish like a heathen. Take a pail and bring more water in here. Your brother's going to wash. I need to blow my nose. Sorry, guys. Okay, continuing on. Levi nodded, grabbed a pail, and ran out. I felt sorry for him. Not only did he have to bear the death of father, which would weigh more heavily upon him than on me, but he must have experienced his first day of taking the kind of tongue lashing that I considered a normal part of my existence. I want no talk of killing in this house, Mother said to me. The committee will do that, will do what has to be done, and I am ready to accept that but I will not have people in my home talking as if we shed the last vestige of our Christianity and become barbarians. If the redcoats were defeated, it was because God willed their defeat and, and because the awful hand of Jehovah smote them. Not because you and others were out there behaving as if you had never known the shelter of a decent Christian home. I will have no boasting and bragging over the death of any human being. 
whether our people or their people, and I will thank you to remember that, Adam Cooper. It's kind of funny. He never even answered the question, and she gave him a lecture. It relieved me enormously to hear mother talk the way, that way in just that tone. It meant that she was becoming her old self again, that she would pull herself out of her grief, and that our home would be more than I had hoped for. As for the hand of Jehovah, that was not anything to provoke an argument about, especially since the Reverend was bound to support her. For my part, I was so weary and confused at this point, and my recollection of the day was so chaotic that I was willing to give credit due to anything that helped us through it. Take off your coat, Mother said. Granny, meanwhile, put wood in the hearth and filled another kettle with water. Mother stared at my shirt helplessly and asked Granny, Is it worth trying to mend it? Shirts don't grow on trees, Sarah. Granny replied, we'll wash it and then we'll see. You can't judge a garment when it's dirty. Then she said to me, there's water heating. Get out of your clothes, boy, and scrub down. Levi will bring you your things. I stood in the, woody, the wooden body tub in the kitchen and soaked myself and scrubbed myself while Levi brought me water and worked the scrubbing brush on my back. I had a long scratch against my ribs and Levi wanted to know whether that was where a red coat musket had, ball had nicked me. That's a real foolish question. Well, it's a wound, isn't it? Of course it isn't a wound. It's a scratch. I got it crawling through the underbrush. It seems to me, Levi said, that if I had been fighting all day in, the, in a battle, I would have gotten myself a wound at least. Just don't let Mother hear you talking like that, I warned him. What's wrong with her, Adam? Who? Mother. Well, how would you feel if you were married with children and everything and your husband was lying upstairs dead the way Father is? He began to blubber. I told him as kindly as I could. Now listen to me, Levi. Father's dead. That's all there is to it, and you might as well be a man enough to face it. You can't break into tears every time anyone mentions his name. We have very large responsibilities, you and me. What kind of responsibilities, Adam? Well, just every kind. Who's going to take care of mother and granny if we don't? And what about the garden and the farming work? I know that we have some shares in some of the enterprises in Boston, but no one knows if there'll be any income out of that now. You know how mother is. She wouldn't accept help because help would be the same as charity, which is all right if you offer it to someone else. Levi nodded somberly. Bring me the towels. He brought me the towels and I rubbed myself dry. Did you go up and look at father, he asked me. I did. I went up there with old Mrs. Cartwright. I hate her. I don't like her, but I guess she tries to do the best that she can. They say that she cuts open dead people and takes out their innards. Of all the fool things you hear, he handed me the clean clothes and I began to dress. She's just an old lady. She's a witch. You just don't say anything like that. You ought to have better sense. What is it like to be dead, Adam? How do I know I've never been dead? You don't have to scream at me. I'm not screaming at you, but what do you want me to do when you ask all these crazy questions? How do I know what it's like to be dead? I don't know. I only mean, Levi protested, that if you go to heaven, you're not here, are you? I mean, Father's not upstairs on the bed. It's just a body, isn't it? What's the use of talking about it, that Levi? I was just thinking about ghosts. I don't believe in ghosts, I said. There's no such thing. Jonathan Crisp saw a ghost and talked to it. It was last December. He was lying. Well, how do you know? How can you say that he was lying and be so sure about it? You weren't there when he saw the ghost. All right, believe whatever you want. Leave me alone. I can't help it. What can't you help? I asked shortly, being afraid. Whatever is there to be afraid of now? The redcoats are gone. Well, weren't you afraid? Didn't you, didn't you run away? So did everyone else run away. It's all right for you to talk, but you don't know what it is to stand there and have all those guns go off in your face. I would have run away, Levi agreed. Well, I'm pleased that you have enough modesty to admit it. I thought maybe that you were braver than the entire committee. Suppose the red, carts, the red coats come back at him. They won't come back. It was a battle, and we won the battle. They came back here, Levi said. A lot of them were bleeding and dead. They carried the dead men. I saw a man whose hand was shot off, and they wrapped his hand in a jacket. He kept on screaming anyway. Saul Parker said he was sure to die. The whole common was filled with them, and they were mighty provoked. You should have heard the way they talked. They broke into Fair, the Fairfax place and took all the silver. Then they broke into Joshua's, Joshua Bond's shop and stole everything there, and they set his house on fire. And they set the Loring house on fire, too, and Goody Milliken's house. You never saw anything burn like that, Adam. One of them kicked Goody Fairfax, but then another one of them got mad and said that she was just an old lady, and what did they want to kick her for? Two of them searched our whole house, and Granny followed them from room to room. And she had told them that if she were a man, they wouldn't come walking into our house like that. 
Then they cut the bell ropes in the meeting house. They took Mother's silver teapot. She never said a word. Granny ran after them, calling them thieves and cutthroats. They said we were all too rich for dirty gillies or dirty jillies. What's a jilly, Adam? Some kind of Scott farmer, I think. Remember, a jilly is like, a, like saying you're low class, you're poor, you're a peasant. Did the other army come here too? They came from Boston. You never saw so many red cars, coats as were here then. The whole town swarmed with them, and you could hear the shooting from the battle to the east. Did you shoot any of them, Adam, really? I don't know. Then they stole all the carriages. They took both our horses. No, they didn't, I cried. They did. They stole the Loring horses and Mr. Bedford's team of greys, and all the horses in the livery stables, and the Hancock carriage, and the Hodley carriage, and both carriages from Buckman's place, and all the horses from there. Why, they were running around just like they were crazy. And one of them hit me on my head with his crop. Feel it right here. He pushed his head aside, and I felt the lump on his head and asked him, What did he want to do that for? He said I had no business snooping around, he, and he cussed me out. One of them threatened to stick his bayonet into Johnny Carver. He's only nine years old. Can you imagine? All we were doing was looking at the dead redcoats. They said they laid them out on the common, 42 of them. Then they piled the bodies into the Loring freight ragged, wagon and into the other wagons, but you could still, still see all the blood stains on the grass on the common. Then they marched out on Monotony Road, and they were hardly gone when the Concord and Sudbury men got here. There was such yelling and screaming and cheering. All the women came running out, with just everybody kissing and hugging. You never saw such a thing, Adam. Really, never. Then we thought we'd ring the bells, but the ropes were cut. Then I ran home, and Ephraim Collin, who, was, who has the mill outside of Concord, he said he saw you lying dead. But where were you then, Adam? I was in the big old windfall down on Monotony Road. That was a funny place to be. It was. I agreed. While I bathed and dressed in clean clothes, the neighbors had been coming in the front room. A number of women would have come earlier, but they were waiting for bread to raise or for pudding to finish because you can't come empty-handed to a home of the dead. Others brought meat roasts, sweetmeats, and maple sugar crowns until the dining room table was loaded with enough food to last us a month. The women felt they had to do a certain amount of weeping just out of respect, and since these things are contagious, Mother was crying again. I went over to her and she took, she took my hands and said, Adam, Adam, whatever are we going to do? I tried to tell her that everything would be all right and that we, we would get along. It was worse for Levi. All the women were overwrought and distracted after the night and the day they had lived through, and they had to, and they had to embrace Levi and cry over him to their satisfaction. But at least there was a wonderful closeness, the storm having swept over all of us, and I think that was a comfort to Mother. Cousin Simmons and the Undertaker and the Fairview brothers, who were sort of akin to us but distantly, came down the stairs carrying the coffin, and Cousin Simmons suggested that I help them bear it over to the meeting house. I welcomed a reason to take me out of the house and away from the women, for the tears started all over again when they saw the coffin. We cut across the common with the coffin. It was twilight now. The sun set and the gentle pink light of the evening lying low on the western sky. The color was so pretty that it broke my heart to look at it. The air sweet and clean. This was the same place I had fled from twelve hours or so before, but the count of time had no meaning. And the April morning when I had departed properly belonged in a past so distant and different that it could hardly be evoked. Even if all the scars were healed, nothing would ever be the same again. It was quiet on the common. The blackened ruins of the burned houses still smoked, but there was no sound of war in the air, no smell of gunpowder, no agonized screaming of the wounded, no curses of the enraged. A cannon, spiked and dismounted, lay on the common, a British supply cart with a broken wheel, and a dozen or so smashed hogsheads. There were broken muskets, bit bayonets, powder bottles, knapsacks, a red uniform coat torn and blood a red uniform coat, coat torn and blood stained a lady's dress and a pewter pot dropped by a looter caleb harrington's terrier dead as if fate tirelessly stalked the harrington family a cocked hat with the ugly mash of skin and blood inside it no one touched such things tomorrow they would be burned a half a dozen books with pages torn out and fluttering in the evening breeze as if there could be no barbarism without the destruction of a book a child's bonnet and a shoe a strange woeful pointless litter where a battle or a massacre had occurred. However, it would be recalled and remembered. 
I had survived it, but my father and other men had died here. And then the same army that killed my father had been driven back here, hurt and bleeding, to make a rendezvous with a relief army out of Boston. And while they swarmed all over this place, my brother Levi and the other children of the village ran among them with that incredible immunity of childhood. For myself, I had parted with childhood and boyhood forever. Don't you hear me, Adam? The undertaker was asking. Yes, sir, I heard you. I mean that a man has some feeling about his profession. It was It's not just an ordinary profession. I like to think that the bereaved take comfort out of my work, but this isn't the best, hardly. It's makeshift, that's what it is, Adam. The same kind of makeshift that I put together for the Parkers and the Hodleys and the Harringtons, and old Mrs. Fess, who heart, whose heart gave out. You wouldn't think so, would you? With all this fuss and calamity, and with Archie Hoggins from Watertown, they got dead of their own, believe me, begging for help. Well, you just wouldn't think that an old lady would die at a time like this. I offer apologies. It's pine boards knocked together and not even stained. It's all right. That's kind of you to say so, Adam. But your father liked the best. That was one thing you could say about Moses Cooper. He liked the best. The best quality. Now there's no reason why we can't change it later, but... I was pleading silently for him to shut up, and I was grateful to Cousin Simmons when he said, Later is plenty of time for such things. Leave the boy in peace now. I didn't mean to trouble the boy, Joseph. I just figured to tell, leave him in peace. You and I will talk about it if it needs talking about. When we came to church, there was quite a small crowd standing around outside, among them a number of people whose faces I didn't recognize. I learned later that all the committee in Middlesex had appointed representatives to obtain accurate depositions of what had happened on the common. And while there were certainly good intentions at work, I doubt that the clear and absolute truth will ever be known. Inside the meeting house were more people, at least half of the committee and a good many relatives of the deceased. We laid Father's coffin down next to the coffins that were already in front of the pulpit. It was quite dark now, and Hiram, the sexton, was lighting candles. He's like an assistant minister. The reverend sped, spread a black cloth, cloth over Father's coffin, an act which comforted me, for in all truth I had been depressed by the green pine look of it. A man who said he was from the advertiser in Boston buttonholed me and asked whether he could question me about what had happened on the common, and I was past being able to think clearly. I begged him to put his questions to someone else. Don't you have an interest in the truth, Mr. Cooper? He called me Mr. And anticipating that I wouldn't be able to, anticipating that I wouldn't be able to resist the flattery. I'm too tired to know what the truth is. A patriot always knows what the truth is. I stared at him dumbly. A big bluff man in his 40s, dressed in good black worsted and white linen, a broad fleshy face, a deep rumbling voice that made my own, my own sound to me like a hopeless squeak. I shook my head and pushed past him out of the church. The crowd outside in front was larger, and a man who appeared to know just about all there was to know was telling them about the situation in Boston, that a siege of the city and the redcoats within it was being planned, and what the pledges of this committee and that committee were. I listened to him for a minute or two and found myself dozing. Then someone took my arm and drew me away. It was Cousin Simmons. Come away from there, Adam, my boy, he said. After a day like ours, it is as hard to endure oratory as the measles. I wish that Moses Cooper were, was here. He had a most marvelous gift for putting a man in his place. I nodded and Cousin Simmons, Cousin Simmons went on. Don't you think that it is cruel or don't think you, don't you think that it is cruel or insensitive of me, Adam, to talk about your father? But it seems to me that it is the most harmful for a person to bury the dead in his own heart, as well as in the cold earth. Goody Simmons would have the skin off my back were I to cast one small doubt on this question of personal survival after death. And if the truth be told, I know no more than the next one. But I do know that something important survives in our children. Your father was a hard man to know, Adam. And sometimes a body just had to grind his teeth and say, well, that's Moses Cooper, and that's the way he is, and there isn't one blessed thing, blessed thing you can do to change him. But the way he was, Adam, was a most remarkable way. He was an educated man, like most men of the men in our family. He was a prudent man, a wise man. He put away for a, way, a rainy day, and you and your mother will be provided for. But he was not a miserly man. No, sir, he was not. He was a man of many strong convictions, and you had to suffer somewhat to be his friend or his son. I'm not complaining, I muttered. I know you're not. Nevertheless, if you recollect him as a saint, you will lose him. Moses Cooper was no saint. He was just as stubborn as a Methodist preacher, but he was a brave man with fine convictions, and I don't think there was ever a day went by that I didn't feel pride and satisfaction in knowing he was my friend. Is that true, Cousin Simmons? I asked him. 
as true as the gospel. I was so happy last night, I whispered, when we walked across the common. He put his arm on my shoulders. I felt that he truly loved me. That was the first time I ever felt it. My voice broke, and in another moment I would have been crying. But Cousin Simmons put his own big hand on my shoulder and with the, with the other indicated the houses around the common. There it is, Adam, sir. We took up arms for our home place, and he died for it. That's an old, old way, Adam. Older than you or me, remember. There are worse ways for a man to die. I'll tell you. I tell you. I nodded in silence. We walked along the edge of the common, the first of the evening dropping like a curtain all around us, and then Cousin Simmons pointed toward Buckman's Tavern. The, com the committee board meets there tonight, Adam. Oh, it was our feeling that we should issue, issue some sort of statement in regard to and respect for our dead, some small tribute which the Reverend Wood could read from the pulpit tomorrow. I think the committee must be heard on that, don't you? I do, I agreed. Father would have been the first to sit to want for that for someone else. He was very strong for the committee. Rightly so, Adam. God help us, today was strange enough. But can you imagine what today would have been without the committee? Yeah, I think so, yes. We talked we walked a little farther and Cousin Simmons said, They'll be opening up the, the muster book, Adam. Sir? It's the word on the siege of it's the word on the siege of Boston. They'll want five thousand committeemen at least, every town. Will you be signing it, Cousin Simmons? I don't know, he replied slowly. This is one time I do wish to heaven that I had Moses Cooper's advice. I don't know what's beginning, Adam, or how or when it's going to end. I have three women folk at home, no sons and a forge, a blacksmith's prime, a blacksmith's prime to a town. If you ever thought about it, Adam, no smith, no iron, no iron, and the town is going to dry up and die. So I've got to consider it. I can't make any snap decisions, can I? No, sir, I don't think you can. Any more than you can, Adam. Sir? A war has begun, Adam. Not just a battle, but a war. Haven't you thought about that? My heart was heavy as lead. I replied, no, sir, I don't think I have. But you, you have to, you know. Now here we are, almost at Buckman's. You're mighty tired, so go home now, Adam. Think about it. I'll see you in the morning. I said good night to him and turned back in the direction of my home. Okay, go ahead and we'll talk about it for a minute and then you can answer your journal questions in your um, your reading in your reading journal. If it's the afternoon block, you're going to have to just answer the questions because I will be at the meeting for um, the teacher leaders tomorrow afternoon, which is today to you. So you can always just send me a message if you're not sure, but I think that the chapter is pretty clear. I'll talk to you all later.